We're going to start out just kind of a general overview. Um, this is our wonderful building that we are in here today. Hope you enjoy while you're here. Okay. The strategic plan for the Department of Health Services. Uh, they came up with some priorities for the three-year plan coming up on that 2014 date very quickly. Um, one of the main things that was um, put forth in that plan is to integrate physical and behavioral health services. We're looking at trying to offer everything possible for the client, kind of a one-stop shop sort of a thing. So we can give them everything that they need for their well-being. Whoops, I'm sorry, wrong way. There we go. So there was a House Bill 2634 that was put into effect that stated on before July 1st that we would have the rules reviewed, rewritten, updated. And as you can tell, we are right now past the July 1st, and that's because there was some things that came up as we got closer to the end, trying to clarify, make additional changes, modifications. So that's why we've been pushed back a little bit in our time frames. But the reasons for having the update in the rules is to try to reduce uh, monetary and regulatory costs and mostly to streamline the regulation process. Getting out of the regulation um, role and having you um, tell us what's going to be going on within your facilities and us not being so specific for you. So we're going to streamline the process. The new integrated rules are going to focus on health and safety for the most part. I'll be uh, providing regulatory consistency for all healthcare institutions. Again, streamlining the process, integration, and everything now will be under, um, will be R910s. In the past, you've seen R920 for whatever your subclass is. We're now going to be R910s. The integration plan, your, your facility is going to be licensed based on the highest level of services that you provide. You'll be giving us, um, you'll be choosing from a menu of service services and you'll be giving us what services you will be providing at your individual facilities. Medical services must be provided under the direction of a physician. Nursing services provided under the direction of an RN. Behavioral health services provided under the direction of a licensed behavioral health professional or a psychiatrist. And your BHTs and BHPPs are going to be receiving clinical oversight or direct supervision from the BHP. And as we get into the articles, we'll talk a little bit more about what clinical oversight is and what direct supervision. The rules were filed with the Secretary of State on June 21st. Like we said, there were some modifications and things that need to take place. So the new implementation date is October 1st. Between now and then, we are having these little mini trainings like this. Also, um, medical will be providing a couple trainings in September. I believe it's the 16th and 17th. Um, as well. So what does this mean to you? As of October 1st, you will be responsible to be following the new rules. So um, start talking and educating your staff, your boards, um, your physicians, everybody onto what the new rules are going to be as it applies to your agency. Okay. So what has changed? Review the rules, some of the content, definitions, there's a few additions, the interpretations, obviously the article numbers. Um, we hopefully will not be seeing any R920s written down anywhere because we are under the tens. Um, so again, a lot of it has been streamlined more for you, so there's not a big major drastic change in many of the rules. For more information, this is the website, and Brian just passed out the little business card for you that has the uh, web address to this. You can access draft rules there, information about trainings. You can sign up for trainings on that website. There will be a um, FAQ section for frequently asked questions, and this website is pretty much kept up to date as much as possible. So this will be your go-to spot. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to Brian, and he's going to talk, I believe, Article 1. Correct. Oops, here we go. Okay, the way that we're, we kind of decided to do this, and we got good feedback when we did it with the outpatient group, is we're actually going to go through the rules. Um, and we're going to stop at some of the things that have changed. So um, I'm going to be scrolling down 
a fair amount of the time, but um, like, I, like we said, we'll open it up for questions. We left plenty of time. So just make sure that if we get to a spot and you have a question, make sure you write it down so that we can answer that. Um, and some of this, um, as you look at it, uh, it's going to be dependent on your subclass. So everyone is going to be in Article 1, and then it depends on what your subclass is. So for you guys, you're going to be in Article 3 as well. Um, that's where the inpatient rules are going to go. So we'll start with just some of the general. Um, these kind of were, if you're familiar with the current rules, we always had the universal rules. These are kind of the, now the general rules for all the healthcare institutions. And if you go to the website, um, as of, I think, Tuesday, they removed the Article 1 and now just put general. So if you're looking for this, you're just looking for the general rules, um, and that's where we're at with this. So for a behavioral health inpatient facility means a healthcare institution that provides continuous treatment to an individual experiencing a behavioral health issue that causes the individual to have a limited or reduced ability to meet the individual's basic physical needs, suffer harm that significantly impairs the individual's judgment, reason, behavior, or capacity to recognize reality, uh, danger to self, danger to others, PAD or gravely disabled, okay? So like we were talking, some of the definitions have changed a little bit, so you just want to make sure that you're familiar with the way that they're written um, going forward on October 1st. A behavioral health observation stabilization services means crisis services provided in an outpatient setting to an individual whose behavior or condition indicates that the individual requires nursing services, may require medical services, and may be a danger to others or a danger to self. Okay, for the behavioral health observation and stabilization service, that piece of it is actually in the outpatient rules. So when at the tail end of this training today, we're gonna go through that in kind of detail um, because that's a very new component and it's gonna somewhat be tied to um, potentially like an inpatient facility, okay? So we'll get to that at the very end. Behavioral health professional um, means an individual is licensed under ARS, uh, th Title 32, and whose scope of practice allows the individual to independently engage in the practice of behavioral health, and except for a licensed substance abuse technician, engage in the practice under direct supervision, okay? The thing that's changed with how we're defining behavioral health professional is that a registered nurse with one year full-time behavioral health work experience is no longer considered a behavioral health professional, okay? Now, as we're kind of going forward, there were some omissions. There's gonna be some tweaks to this. Um, we're also considering a licensed psychologist as a BHP. That's one that will be put back into it, okay? So for, the, for this one, the big thing, the RN, is no longer considered a behavioral health professional. Now, the definition of clinical oversight means the monitoring uh, the behavioral health services provided by a BHT to ensure that the BHT is providing the services according to the healthcare institution's policies and procedures providing ongoing review of the behavioral health techs, skills and knowledge related to the provision of behavioral health services, providing guidance to improve the BHT skills and knowledge related to the provision of behavioral health services, and recommending training for the BHT to improve the behavioral health technician skills and knowledge related to the provision of behavioral health services. Okay. This one is taking the place of clinical supervision. Okay. Now, for a behavioral health technician, they need to get clinical oversight. For a behavioral health paraprofessional, they need to get direct supervision if they're providing a licensable service, okay? So keep that in the back of your mind. There's no kind of general clinical supervision anymore. If they're a BHT, they get clinical oversight based on this definition. And then when we get to the part where we talk about the paraprofessionals, we'll get into what the direct supervision looks like. 
contracted services means medical services, nursing services, health-related services, ancillary services, or environmental services provided according to a documented agreement between the healthcare institution and the person providing the medical, nursing, healthcare, ancillary, or environmental services. So when you see contracted services, that doesn't mean a, co a contractual agreement with staff. That means the agreement that you have for the cleaning crew to come in, okay, or if you have any other type of just a contractual agreement um, to provide one of those services. And you can see as you kind of scroll down just some of the stuff that's in here because this is all for all of the healthcare institutions. Um, so again, not all of these are going to be applicable. In-service education means the organized instruction or information that is related to a physical health service or behavioral health service that is provided to a medical staff member, personnel member, employee, or volunteer. Okay. In-service education now is taking the place of training for the BHTs and the paraprofessionals. Okay. The next one is an interval note. This means documentation updating a patient's medical condition after a medical history and physical examination is performed or a behavioral health issue after an assessment is performed. So for you, as part of whenever someone is doing that piece, you have to put another note in saying what actually happened, what happened with that assessment, okay? So that's an additional piece and it's called, gonna be called an interval note. And a lot of this stuff, if you see it here, we've got it in the article. So um, again, we'll talk about this at the end of the training. An observation chair means a physical piece of equipment that is located in a designated area where behavioral health observation stabilization services are provided, allows an individual to fully recline, and is used by the individual while receiving crisis services. Now, one of the other changes, too, is the terminology of what currently are staff members. All of this will be going to a personnel member. Okay, so staff will no longer be the, the definition. Scope of services means a list of the behavioral health services or physical health services the governing authority of the healthcare institution has designated as being available to a patient at the healthcare institution. Okay. The scope of service is basically taking over the program description. Okay. If you remember in a program description, you had to identify, for example, when the administrative hours were, when the clinical hours were. The scope of service is actually going to take the list part of that, and you're still going to have to describe it to some detail. We just don't want, you know, the list. But it's not nearly as detailed as the old program description. Now, some of the stuff that was on the program description is actually going to be on the application now. So you're still going to have to identify administrative hours, clinical hours, you know, which are 24-7, basically. Um, so it's not like we're just gutting the program descriptions. Some of that information is just going to be put in a different spot, okay? But from now on, or starting in October, you're going to be talking about the scope of services uh, piece of that. So your subclass now will become a behavioral health inpatient facility.
and a healthcare institution license is required for each healthcare institution. Okay, so for every address, it needs now to have a license. And then you can see for the architectural type of stuff, um, most of that's not applicable. Right? And then, like the initial license application starting on October 1st, there's going to be new forms for all of that stuff. Um, same with the renewals. Um, so there's just a few kind of tweaks when it comes to um, the kind of information that's going to be on that. Um, but not a whole lot's changed with that. Um, as part of this process, nothing changed with the fees. Um, it's still the same for the license fee and the bed fee. And that's just dependent on the number of beds that your facility has. And as you go through and you look, um, when it comes to the time frames, the time frames have changed a little bit um, when it comes to the renewal as well as to the initial. Um, they've actually been shortened a little bit on our part. So, um, and again, if you have any kind of changes to the license or an amend or anything like that, then you would follow these rules. The other part talks about kind of the general rule on whether or not um, TB test is applicable, okay? It's not in the general rules and it wasn't based on subclass the way that it was, okay? If, you, if your agency or your subclass requires it, it's actually gonna be in the article, okay? So these are the general, we're in article one. When you go into article three, if it says that you have to have TB test, that's where it's going to state that for both clients as well as your personnel. Okay. So this part is talking about the behavioral health paraprofessionals and behavioral health technicians. For the paraprofessional, you have to delineate the services the BHPP is allowed to provide at or for the healthcare institution. If a BHPP provides services under the practice of marriage and family therapy, professional counseling, social work, or substance abuse, you ensure that the BHPP is under the supervision of an individual licensed to provide that specific service being provided by the paraprofessional. Establish qualifications for providing supervision to that paraprofessional and establish documentation and requirements for the supervision required. Now for a BHT, you have to delineate the services again that they are allowed to provide established qualifications for BHP providing clinical oversight to that BHT. If the BHT is providing marriage and family therapy counseling, social work, or substance abuse counseling, you will ensure that the BHT is under the clinical oversight of a BHP license to provide that specific service being provided to the BHT. You have to delineate the methods used to provide clinical oversight, including when clinical oversight is provided on an individual basis or a group setting. If clinical oversight is provided electronically, you ensure that it is provided verbally with direct and immediate interaction between the health professional providing that and the BHT receiving it, and a secure connection is used. Okay. Now you have to, as part of providing clinical oversight to that BHT, 
they have received clinical oversight at least once during each two-week period if the behavioral health technician provides services related to patient care at the healthcare institution during the two-week period. Okay. That's different than the way it is now. Okay. BHT or a pair of professionals working full time, they need four hours in a calendar month. Or if they're working part time, they need one hour for every 40 hours worked. For the BHT, again, they receive clinical oversight at least once during each two work two week period. You will establish that. Because right here, you'll, the licensee will, shall establish the duration of clinical oversight provided to a BHT to ensure that the patient needs are met for the BHT and the scope and extent of the services provided, the acuity of the patients receiving services, the number of patients receiving services. And then you're going to document the clinical oversight and establish a, the process by which information pertaining to services provided by a BHT is provided to the BHP who is responsible for the clinical oversight of that BHT. Okay. One of the things that you're going to see, especially when we go into Article 3, is, is that when October 1st comes, you're going to become an agency where it's going to be much more policy driven on your part. Okay? We've deregulated a lot of stuff when it comes to what's in the general rules and what's in each of the rules for the subclasses. So we always kind of did hold you responsible for following your policies and procedures, but in our rules, we kind of dictate it. So if you remember, like orientation had to include these six elements, okay? When we talk about all of that stuff, you're going to see it's deregulated. You guys as an entity know probably better what's, what's better for you to orient staff than we do, okay? That's where you're seeing BHTs, paraprofessionals, we used to designate. You had to meet this certain criteria. Now you guys have to develop that, okay? And we'll talk about kind of, you're still going to need those policies, but we're not going to be as prescriptive as we were in the past. And again, you'll see that a lot of this, because it's kind of a general universal rule, is not going to be applicable to you. And again, there are usually some definitions in each of the articles as you get to them. Okay. So with that, I'll pass this to Alice. We don't have anything to do kind of with that piece of it. Um, that's where you're going to have to work with your referral sources and all of that stuff. Okay. We're going to get moving into the nuts and bolts of things in Article 3. Um, again, we're going to try to do a, um, a nice time frame of questions and answers at the end because um, we are, are filming <laughs> and we want to make sure we're able to get all the information. And then the questions that you ask, we will be able to put up on our website as well for people who weren't here. So looking in Article 3, you have a few additional definitions here. Oh, no, you don't. It just says to follow those in ARS 36401 and then 10101, um, which is the general what we just reviewed. Okay, supplemental application requirements. These are the different things that you can provide as part of your scope of services for your facility. Um, behavioral health observation stabilization services, like Brian said, we will go more in depth on that at the end of the training. It's a little bit more information. Okay, in administration, you are going to be establishing and writing your scope of services, um, just like he said what it is you're going to do, give us a little description of what it is, um, and it does replace what used to be the program description. 
Okay. All right, moving into here, you're going to establish your policies and procedures. There are two kinds of, your, of policies and procedures that you're going to be developing. One is going to be your administrative PNPs. The other is going to be your service-oriented PNPs, about your services. The rules that you're reviewing today and that you will be following is the end result. That's, that's the outcome. That's the rules you need to follow, basically, to play the game. The policies and procedures that you will be developing is telling us what it is and how you're going to do that. So stating that a licensee shall ensure this will take place, that's not a policy and procedure. We want to know how are you going to ensure it. Okay, so please keep that in mind when you are updating your PNPs um, that you will be kind of following, following that. And we do a lot of discussion with folks now, even on surveys. You probably have had your surveyors talk about, okay, policy and procedure. What exactly is your procedure about this? Um, one of the examples I gave uh, our last training was, say, a policy on fingerprinting. There is a spot in here in the rule that references statute regarding who needs to be fingerprinted. Um, you may have a policy and procedure. Your policy agency XYZ will ensure the safety of their clients by um, requiring all staff to be fingerprinted or all direct staff, whatever your policy may be. Your procedure then is how are you going to make sure that that happens. Upon hire, a person will have a fingerprint clearance card or they will have um, five days to apply for the card and then you'll put the application and the affidavit in their file. What are you going to do if you haven't received the card within so many days or if it's denied, revoked? So what is your, poli your procedure? What are the steps you're going to do to make sure that you're meeting your policy? All right. Um, going back also real quickly with some of the changes in the vocabulary. We're establishing, documenting, and implementing policies and procedures. Um, we used to um, say develop, implement, and comply. So just a few changes on the words. Don't let it throw you. <laughs> okay, so these are the policies that you're going to want to cover, CPR, first aid training, um, specific steps for a patient to file a complaint. Um, so policies and procedures in Section 2 here are for the behavioral health services and physical health services covering patient screening, admission, assessment, restraint and seclusion, medication, uh, if you're going to be doing telemed, environmental services, all of those sections are covered in here. So when you go to write your PNPs, you're going to be looking at this section 303, which will give you your um, outline on what you need to cover. Okay, an administrator shall designate a medical director who will provide direction for physical services physical health services provided by or at the behavioral health inpatient facility and is a physician or a registered nurse practitioner. Okay, so that's your medical director. Your clinical director will be providing direction for the behavioral health services provided by or at the facility, is a behavioral health professional, and may be the same as the, as the administrator if they meet the qualifications in the subsections listed. You must also have a registered nurse to provide direction for nursing services provided by or at the facility. You must have all three of these um, physicians, these folks. Okay. Um, notifying the department. The instant reporting on our end is going down. Um, you may have other requirements contractually with other entities, funding sources and such as that, but as far as OBHL is concerned, you're going to be notifying us of a patient's death within one day um, and you're going to notify us of a self-injury or an accident that requires immediate emergency medical 
services within two days. Okay, just a self injury, not an accident. The other is abuse, neglect, or exploitation of a patient. With that, you are going to do an investigation. Um, and F, how F and G is split up is F is if a patient alleged or there's suspicion that it has occurred before they were admitted to the patient or while they were not on the premises. And G is if it's suspected to have occurred on the premises or while they're receiving services from your facility. You're going to take immediate action, obviously, to stop the alleged or suspected abuse, neglect, and exploitation, and then report that to one of two. If it's a child under the age of 18, obviously you're going to be contacting CPS and law enforcement. And if it's an adult, you're going to be contacting APS. You will document the action that you took and then maintain that documentation for 12 months. You also do an investigation of the situation within 48 hours and write a report that includes all of this information. And then your investigation will be submitted to the department within 10 working days. Then again, you must maintain that documentation on site for 12 months. You're going to establish and document criteria for when a resident's absence is unauthorized. So AWOLs, you don't need to report AWOLs to us, but you are going to be establishing a criteria for that. And as we get in a little bit further, one of the requirements is that you'll be keeping a log of those. So if a resident is unauthorized as determined according to the criteria in subsection H that you have created, written report within one hour determining whether their absence is unauthorized to if the resident is under the age of 18 to the parent legal guardian and possibly to the courts and maintaining the documentation. So you're not reporting anything to us, you're just maintaining documentation about it. Okay. The quality management plan. Um, there is, actually we go to our website that we've given you the cards to, there is a PowerPoint and a training that has been developed and already presented on um, developing a quality management plan. Um, this is the information that you're going to need. When, when you identify an issue or a problem, you obviously will have taken some steps to correct that or how you're going to um, work past that in the future. That's part of your quality management plan. So if we're out doing a survey and we are identifying maybe a problem and you say, yes, we've identified that same problem and this is what we've done. You have already seen something and you've taken action on it and you have a plan about how you would correct it or, again, keep it from occurring in the future. Your contracted services, like Brian had said, again, if you are contracting with any type of food services, um, exterminating services, transportation, anything like that, that is not a contractual agreement that you have with a staff person, or rather now a personnel. So we move into personnel. Um, again, we are not using the term staff, rather, but personnel. And personnel must be at least 21 years of age. Your student can be 18, and a volunteer also needs to be 21. So the administrator will ensure that all these following qualification skills, knowledge required, are based on the type of services, whether they're behavioral health or physical services, that are to be expected to be provided by this personnel member according to their job description, and the acuity of the patient receiving those services. They include the specific skills and knowledge necessary for personnel to provide these services as established in the job description, the type and duration of education that may allow this person to acquire the specific skills and knowledge, and then the type and duration of experience. Like Brian said, we are no longer going to say they have to have this many years of education, this many years of experience in the field. You're going to be determining that. So you'll determine what they are and what are the skills and knowledge that qualify that person to be a BHT or a BHPP. 
if you recall, um, in the current rules, if you looked in 204F, it talks about skills and knowledge and it lists a slew of things that need to be verified. G is how it's verified. This is kind of that section. It's just, again, we're taking away what the specific things are and you're going to be doing that. <clears throat> okay. Okay, in H, we talked about orientation. Brian had mentioned that already. Um, you're going to determine what your staff need to be oriented to, what the duration is, and also which staff are required to have this orientation. So you will be doing that. Um, is, let's see, in service, is that in here? No, it's a little bit farther down. Um, yeah, the in-service documentation, the education is documented, gives you all the information on how it needs to be documented. You're going to determine no longer is it that we require 48 hours the first year and 24 hours each additional year. You will determine what that's going to be. All right. Um, in L, an administrator will ensure that if a patient requires medical services that your facility is not authorized or able to provide, that you arrange for the patient to be transported to a hospital or another healthcare institution where it can be provided. And if your facility and the behavioral health inpatient facility must have a written agreement with a hospital near the facility's location to provide medical services for patients who require services that you cannot provide or you are not authorized to provide. So you need to be able to give them the opportunity to receive the other services as required, as needed. Okay, admissions and assessments. Um, there we go. Not a whole whole lot of changes, but there are some in here. Um, the medical practitioner will perform a medical history and a physical exam on a patient within 30 calendar days before admission or within 48 hours after admission and then documents that medical history and physical in the record within 48 hours after admission. It used to be if the client had had a current physical within the last 12 months, you could review it and accept that. The new requirement is now 30 days. And going back to what Brian had talked about in the definitions, the, def the in interval note, number nine, a medical practitioner will enter an interval note after having um, completed the physical exam or nursing assessment on, on the client, on the patient. Okay. Number 11, if an assessment is conducted by a BHT, your determination of a BHT, within 24 hours, a BHP needs to review it and sign it to ensure that it identifies the health services needed by the patient. If an assessment is conducted by a behavior health professional, your BHPP, the BHP supervises them during the completion of the assessment and signs it immediately after completion. So if a BHPP is going to be doing this, your BHP is going to be sitting in the room right next to them while this is going on. A BHT can do it independently, give it to a BHT to, or I'm sorry, a BHP to review and sign, but for a BHPP to do it, your professional, your BHP needs to be there along with them while this is happening. Okay. All right, when a patient is admitted, a registered nurse will assess their medical condition and history, determine whether they require immediate physical health services, and the patient's behavioral health issue that may be related to the patient's medical condition and history. Document the patient's medical condition and history and the determinations required in the record and then signs the patient's medical record. Okay, the assessment, same thing. 
presenting issues, substance abuse, co-occurring disorders, similar to what you are already used to doing. Um, number 15, 16, and 17 kind of go together. A request for participation in the patient's assessment is made to the patient or the patient's representative, which you are currently doing. The opportunity for participation is provided and then what's new is the request that you've made to them to participate needs to be documented in the record. So that's the new one, number 17. Okay. Your treatment plan is completed by a behavioral health professional or a BHT under the clinical oversight of that BHP and it needs to be completed before the patient receives treatment. There's only going to be the one treatment plan. There's no longer the initial and the, um, the master treatment plan later on. Okay, it's documented within 48 hours after the patient first receives treatment. It includes all of this information in here, the presenting issue, the services provided, signature of the patient or their representative, the date signed or documentation of the refusal to sign, the date when the treatment plan will be reviewed, if discharge date has been determined, what treatment is needed after discharge, and then the signature of the personal member who developed the treatment plan and the date signed. Okay, so if the treatment plan is completed by a BHT, it's reviewed and signed by a BHP within 24 hours after the completion of the treatment plan to ensure that the plan meets the needs of this patient. Reviewed as an ongoing basis, that's the same, nothing has changed on that. Okay. All right, discharge. You still must have a discharge plan that identifies all of these areas. The administrator will ensure that again going back to what we were saying with the treatment plan and assessments where they have the opportunity to participate a, a relative or a guardian or the client who will continue to do those things but the new thing is that it's actually it's documented now in the record that they had that opportunity okay mm. I think the things with, with the discharge, um, discharge summaries will need to be done and, I'm sorry, will need to be entered in the medical record within 10 working days after the patient's discharge and will include these areas here. And trying to find, okay, on D, an administrator shall ensure there is a documented discharge order by a medical practitioner before the patient is discharged unless the patient leaves the inpatient facility against advice and you will ensure that they will receive a referral for treatment and ancillary services that they may need after discharge. Um, so the, the change with the discharge summary maybe is going to be the 10 days instead of the 15 days. And transport and transfer, you're going to be developing policies and procedures for both transport and transfer. Transport, basically they're going to be coming back. They may be transporting someplace and then coming back to you. Transfer is they are transferring to another um, facility, another agency. Okay. In the patient's rights, 311, this may look a little bit different than what you're used to seeing. Um, it's just a little bit more condensed and streamlined than what you have seen in the past with the patient's rights, but they, they are still all in here. Okay, and that brings us to medical records, which is Brian. Now, there's not a whole lot that's kind of changed with the medical records outside of the few things that we've already talked about, um, like an interval note. Those are going to be new things that are going to be part of what that medical record is. 
Um, and in here, too, it, it actually starts talking about the electronic records. So there are some things in here that you have to um, follow um, when it comes to safeguarding that to prevent unauthorized access. Um, And this is kind of the stuff that Alice was just talking about, like a disposition of the patient after discharge, um, the discharge plan. And depending on the kind of services that you're going to do, if it would be applicable, you know, a laboratory report, a radiologic report, diagnostic um, documentation of seclusion restraint, well, or a consultation report. So if it's applicable, it still needs to be in the medical record. For patient outings, um, the big thing with this is now there has to be at least two personnel members are present on an outing, okay? And the definition for an outing didn't change. So it's any kind of um, break kind of in the program that lasts more than four hours. Now, the physical health services, um, should you choose to do those, they need to be under the direction of a physician. Um, and these are if you wanted to do that. So this is part of the integrated health. So for, if you wanted to do surgical services, clinical lab services, radiology services, um, perinatal, intensive care, um, it shows you where all of the rules that you would need to be followed for all of that stuff. Now, the behavioral health services. Um, you, uh, administrator shall ensure that the behavioral health services listed in the scope of practice or the scope of services are provided to meet the needs of the patient. When behavioral health services are listed in the behavioral health inpatient facility scope of services, the behavioral health services are provided on the behavioral health inpatient facility premises. And it's provided in a setting or Provided in a setting or activity with more than one patient participating, the patients participating have similar diagnoses, treatment needs, developmental levels, social skills, verbal skills, and personal histories. What this part is kind of talking about is just not necessarily mixing populations. Um, it's kind of a very a global uh, type of rule. So this is in, I believe, multiple kind of subclasses. So um, the big thing is, is just making sure that folks are in an appropriate kind of setting, group, whatever. And for depending on the size and for the inpatient, that's going to be very similar for basically almost everyone in there, depending on what kind of scope of services that you're going to do. Um, the administrator shall ensure that counseling is offered as described in the behavioral health inpatient facility scope of services provided according to the frequency and number of hours identified in the patient's treatment plan and is provided by a BHP or a BHT. Okay, so nothing has changed with in terms of counseling. A behavioral health paraprofessional, if you, how you designate that, still cannot do counseling. Okay. And then the counseling documentation um, is pretty much the same. I think the only thing that's changed with that is that you don't necessarily have to put the duration of how long the counseling was. Now, if you're doing any of the Title 36 services, so the pre-petition screening, court order treatment, or the court order eval, if you've looked at that, um, we've basically deregulated it to the point where we said, Look at Title 36, Chapter 5, and do what's applicable, okay? If you do that, you'll still see that if they're in for a court-ordered eval, the same requ um, requirements that don't need to be done based on a court-ordered eval are still applicable. So if they're in for a court-ordered eval, you don't necessarily need an assessment, a treatment plan, or that consent, okay? Restraint and seclusion, 
there is pretty much the same, but there is one kind of big difference when it comes to an aggressive, violent, self-destructive behavior, okay? So in here, if as a result of a patient's aggressive, violent, or self-destructive behavior, harm to a patient or another individual is imminent, or the patient or another individual is being physically harmed, a personnel member may initiate an emergency application of restraint or seclusion for the patient before obtaining an order for the restraint or seclusion. Now, and you shall obtain an order for the restraint or seclusion of the patient during the emergency application of the restraint or seclusion. Okay, so that's a bit of a change. Okay. And the same documentation is needed um, for the order. And when you look at um, the duration for the order for the restrainer seclusion, it'll dictate, um, you know, if they're age 18 or older, 9 to 17, younger than 9. Now, CMS rules say that you can um, have someone in seclusion restraint for up to four hours if they're an adult, okay? Stricter rule trumps. So the rule says three, so you got to go by three. And the same kind of documentation is needed for all of the seclusion stuff. Another one of the changes comes with what the room used for seclusion is. Okay. It has to be approved for use in, as seclusion by the department. Same kind of uh, stuff, you know, can't be a sleeping area, can't be kind of a PRN sleeping area because it's right next to the RN station, whatever. Now, the seclusion room may be used for services or activities other than seclusion. If, and then it'll detail, if signs stating that the service or activity scheduled or being provided in the room is conspicuously posted outside, there's no permanent equipment other than the bed, there are policies and procedures on uh, what those services or activities other than seclusion may be provided. Um, And then down in D, it says the sign required in 13A and equipment and supplies in the room other than the bed required are removed before a patient is placed in the seclusion room. Okay, so that's parts new as well. And we'll talk briefly um, at the end about the behavioral health observation and stabilization services. Detox. Not a whole lot's changed with that, and detox, detoxification services still can only be done in an inpatient facility. Medication services, um, depending on kind of your program, in the current rules we had medication services in Article 3, and then we had assistance in the self-administration in Article 4. Both of those services now are, are under medication services. So if your facility does assistance in the self-administration of medication, this is where you're going to look because there's not a, a separate section for it. So the medication administration used to be what we called medication services, and then assistance in the self-administration of medication is here. Now, if you do assistance in the self-administration of medication, you have to um, train, training for that personnel member other than the medical practitioner registered nurse in assistance in the self-administration of medication. Um, that it, you have to, as part of the initial training, you have to do a demonstration. And that's all we dictate. So in the past, it used to say then you'd have to have training every 12 months following. We're not saying that, okay? So again, this is where it's going to be policy driven. What is it that you're going to decide for that piece of it? 
The administrator shall ensure that a current drug reference guide is available, a toxicology reference guide is available, and if pharmaceutical services are provided on it, that you have the following documentation. Okay. Now again, this says is available. It doesn't say on the premises. Okay. And then if for whatever reason, if there was a pharmacy on the premises, um, we were, when we come in, we check and make sure that you have a license to op for that pharmacy to operate. Now, the medication storage at the behavioral health inpatient facility, the administrator shall ensure that there is a separate room, closet, or self-contained unit used for medication storage that includes a lockable door. If medication is stored in a separate room or closet, a locked cabinet or container is used for the medication storage. And then it goes to kind of the same, that it's stored based on the instructions of the container. Food services. An administrator shall ensure that the behavioral health inpatient facility is licensed as a food establishment under Title IX, Chapter 8. Okay. In the past, this used to be bed capacity. Okay. So if you met a certain bed capacity, then you had to have it. Now everybody does. Next one comes to the dietitian. You have to, the licensee shall ensure a registered dietitian is employed full time, part time, or as a consultant. And if a registered dietitian is not employed full time, an individual is designated as a director of food services who consults with the registered dietitian as often as necessary to meet the nutritional needs of the patients. Okay. For this part, the registered dietitian doesn't have to sign off on the menus anymore. Okay. And again, this part's talking about the specifics um, that we would be potentially looking for and that you, um, with the dietitian and that director of the food, um, will need to follow. Okay, the next part talks about emergency and safety standards. Um, for a behavioral health inpatient facility, you shall ensure that a fire alarm system installed to the National Fire Protection Association incorporated by reference and a sprinkler system installed according to the above or an alternative method to ensure a patient's safety documented and approved by the local jurisdiction. Okay. So that's where it's basically the same for all of the subclasses where, you know, in the past for the residentials or even the inpatient, it used to be one to three, you had certain things, four to eight, you had certain things, nine or above. Now it's either a sprinkler system or the local fire, fire jurisdiction has to document on the fire report that they're okay with whatever you have, okay? So it's gonna be kind of that stricter rule trumps. They're gonna decide kind of if you don't have a sprinkler system, is the place still safe, okay? And some will just require a sprinkler system flat out depending on the size and what kind of services are gonna happen. You're still going to have a disaster plan. Um, and we're going from fire drills to evacuation drills. Um, now, there's, there are a couple of differences. You have to do an evacuation drill for employees once on each shift every three months. And then you have to do an evacuation drill for employees and patients once every six months. And then that documentation, it basically tells you in six what you need. 
environmental standards. The administrator shall ensure that the premises, the premises and equipment are free from a condition or situation that may cause a patient or other individual to suffer physical injury. Okay, you have to have a pest control program implemented and documented. The equipment has to be maintained in working order, tested and calibrated to the manufacturer's uh, recommendations or if there are none, uh, specified in policies and procedures. Heating and cooling systems. Um, with this, there's still the general range, but the range has changed a little bit. Um, do you remember what they? Yeah, so they've just changed a little bit. I know for the hot water, it went from, it was 90 to 120. Now it's 95 to 120. Okay. And again, depending on the kind of you know, say you were doing a physical health service as well, maybe there's oxygen tanks in there, okay? And then if you're getting any um, water from a non-municipal source, it tells you what you have to do. Um, same for a sewage system. Now, here's where some of the biggest changes have kind of been identified probably within the past 18, to 20 months um, when it comes to now we have some uh, standards for the physical plant. Um, so for the behavioral health inpatient facility, you have to have a waiting area with seating for, patient, for patients and visitors, a room that provides privacy for a patient to receive treatment or visitors, a common area and a dining area with that. Um, a bathroom is available for use by visitors during the facility's hours of operation. Now in the patient bathroom, it complies with the following. It provides privacy when in use, contains a shatterproof mirror unless the patient's treatment plan requires otherwise, a window that opens to, or another means of ventilation, non-porous surfaces or shower enclosures and slip resistant surfaces, um, plumbing, piping, ductwork and other potentially hazard elements concealed above a ceiling, and if the bathroom or shower area has a door, the door swings outward to allow for staff emergency access. And then down here, it kind of talks about um, some ADA type of stuff. So if you have um, the grab bars, the grab bars need to be filled in so that nothing can be tied around them. Um, Uh, you know, this part it's really kind of talking about the anti-ligature components of it. So looking for any type of a ligature point where someone um, can do that. And in the, in the sh shower area, the other thing that we've seen um, has to do with the shower head itself. Um, it's either not recessed enough or it's not kind of the right kind of uh, shower head period. So um, the next part talks about the patient bedroom. Um, and this one, it, again, contains a door that opens into a hallway, common area, or outdoors. Um, okay. Again, another talking about kind of an anti-ligature. Um, in a patient bathroom or a patient bedroom, the ceiling is secured from access or at least nine feet in height. A ventilation grill is secured and has perforations that are too small to use as a tie-off point or sufficient height to prevent patient access. Okay, so what we're kind of looking at would be in the back, what we see are those kinds of uh, covers. Um, so then you have to make sure that the holes are small enough so that someone can't get something threaded through for that piece of it. The door um, has a closing device. If it has a closing device on it, then that closing device has to be on the public side of the door, okay? So it would be like those. That can't be on the inside of the patient's room. Um, door hinges. 
the hinges just can't be that standard hinge that's flat, so something could be put down on it. So it, they can, there's numerous kinds of hinges that you can have, the hidden hinges, ones that are slanted, so there's no point down there. Um, door levers um, have to make sure that either they're slanted so nothing can be put that way. Um, and they have to be, have the tamper resistant fasteners as well. And then windows, um, a window located in an area of a behavioral health inpatient facility that is accessible to patients is fabricated with laminated safety glass or protected by polycarbonate laminate or safety screens. And then C, a bedroom in a behavioral health inpatient facility licensed under license before October 1st, 2013 is not required to have a second means of egress if an administrator ensures that policies and procedures are established, documented, and implemented that provide for a safe evacuation of a patient in a bedroom based on the patient's physical and mental limitations and the location of the bedroom. Okay, so that's Article 3, okay, and it's going to kind of jump you back a little bit depending on if you were going to do um, any kind of additional service outside of the behavioral health component of this. And then the last piece has to do with the behavioral health observation. Now is anyone in here considering doing this? These are basically kind of the chairs model. Okay. So you're going to see in here as part of this, this piece is actually in the outpatient rules. So you're going to have to go into Article 10 and scroll down to find it. Um, but in here, it's going to talk about the services themselves um, and some of the environmental components of it. Um, that behavioral health observation stabilization services are provided in a designated area that are used exclusively for behavioral health observation stabilization services. There are specifics for individuals under the age of 18. For that person, then it's going to be broken down on whether or not they're in the beds in the chairs part of it, or if they're going to potentially be moved to an inpatient facility or moved into the inpatient component of that facility, depending on what it is. So you're going to see in here, it's talking some a bit about the outpatient component of it as well. Um, if they come into that designated area for that, they have to be screened within 30 minutes. And if that screening indicates that an individual needs immediate physical health services, then it tells you what you need to do. And then in this part, it's going to tell you if the screening indicates that the individual needs behavioral health services and the outpatient treatment center has the capabilities to provide that, the individual is admitted for that designated area and can remain in that area for up to 23 hours and 59 minutes. Okay. Then in this part, it's going to talk about um, how they, if you're going to discharge at 2359, or if you're going to transfer or whatever you're going to do, it tells you some specifics on when can you admit them back. So except in A16, the individual is not readmitted to the outpatient treatment center for behavioral health observation stabilization services within two hours after the individual's discharge from the designated area in the outpatient treatment center that provides those services. An individual may be readmitted 
um, to the outpatient treatment center for behavioral health observation stabilization services within two hours after the individual's discharge if it's been at least one hour or if law enforcement or the individual's case manager accompanies that person back. Okay. And then it documents on what kind of documentation that you're going to need to get um, if they do that. In that area for observation and stabilization, you have to have an observation chair or a separate piece of equipment for the individual to use to sit or recline, and then as talks about the specifics of it. Now, the setup of those chairs um, is that you have that, then it has to be uh, visible to a personnel member. Then a patient, a patient admitted to receive behavioral health observation or stabilization services may use a bathroom, may use the bathroom and not be visible to a personnel member if that personnel member determines the patient is capable of using the bathroom unsupervised, is aware of their location, and is able to intervene to ensure the patient's health and safety. And then going forward, um, effective July 1st, 2015, there will be the new standards. Um, so some folks are going to be grandfathered in um, regarding what the space between the observation chairs um, to match what the rules are for like the beds where they're three feet. Um, of space in between them. For that outpatient treatment center, just doing this service, okay, because right now at an outpatient treatment, outpatient clinic that we have, no outpatient clinic can do seclusion and restraint. If you do this service, then you have to develop a policy and procedure for seclusion and restraint. And then effective on July 1st, there's another component of it um, where it talks specifically about um, going above a license capacity. Then you have to come up with a plan in place um, to mitigate that, but that will be starting um, in 2015. Okay, so that's our presentation. Um, we're going to open this up. We're scheduled till noon. So um, Alice and I and Chuck, and um, we certainly want to be able to answer your questions um, when it comes to all of this stuff. So.